it will lead you back to the Catholic Church. I'm talking about a corporation that has been in power for like 1,600 years. The Vatican has dominated Europe, and for 1,600 years, Europe has dominated the world. And so if you take the time to do the research, you will find that all of the, the stuff that's going on on the earth today, all roads lead to Rome. So Hitler goes to Rome and signs a contract in Rome. There he is at the Vatican, Adolf Hitler with the Pope. So when Hitler spoke of the Third Reich, meaning the Third Empire, he was speaking about the restoration of the Holy Roman Empire. The papacy symbols with the swastika. That's in the Vatican. Picture them, the Nazi Catholic priest. Hitler with the papal nuncio. Catholic cardinals. Secretary of State. Here's the papal, uh, the papal Secretary of State leaving uh, a meeting with Adolf Hitler. Another one. Here's another one. See the Nazis standing on both sides and there's the Papal Secretary of State leaving. <coughs> so, Hitler was always <coughs> like to have his picture taken coming out of churches to make you look religious. And, you know. And of course he would bow his head in prayer, better, because the Holy Father you know, will have your head, because he don't give a damn how smart you think you are, or how powerful you think you are. You mess with the Holy Father and you're a dead man, period. So Hitler had to uh, <coughs> appeal to the Catholic Church and um, basically do whatever the Church says do. So here you have the Catholic clergy hiling Hitler Catholic priest, Heiling Hitler. You know. Here are the SS and Gestapo guys going to church. Yeah, it kind of makes you feel warm all over knowing that these guys are going to church. Then they go out and kill babies and children. I'm telling you, there's a lot of stuff that was going on in Germany and Nazi Germany that people have never been told. Where Adolf Hitler got his money, where he got the backing, how he was being financed. His Cardinal Pacelli became later became known as Pope Pius XII. Cardinal Pacelli used to go to uh, Hitler's residence to bring the orders from the Pope. And so the point I'm making here is that the clergy of the Catholic Church are responsible for Adolf Hitler, Mussolini, General Latissimo, Franco, and there's our president bowing down and curtsying to a foreign power. When the United States government and the president is conspiring with foreign powers like Rome, no wonder you have waterboarding and torture and bloodshed all over the Middle East. There's some heavy duty political stuff going on here and Rome is behind it. The Holy Father, here's the Holy Father in the White House, in the Capitol. I gotta tell you, there's nothing holy in Rome. There's uh, Jeb Bush on his knees before the Holy Father. Yeah, he joined Jeb Bush's knighted into the uh, Knights of Columbus. And you'll see the Knights of Columbus symbol is a fasci. Yeah, here she is, Democrat Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, kissing the ring. So here you got both sides, Democrat, Republican, and the papacy in between. Always in the middle of everything is the papacy in New York. Nixon and Kennedy, the Vatican. 
Obama, the Vatican. This may explain the European Union. The Constitution was signed for the new European Union in Rome before a statue of the Pope. This is where the European Union was founded, in Rome, before the Holy Father. So today when you hear about the Euro and the European uh, Union, it's Roman. The Holy Father has decided he's had enough of all this BS about freedom, liberty, and justice, and all of these people running around with their silly nonsense about freedom and liberty and justice. So they're going to teach you a lesson. Nobody tells Caesar that they're free. Nobody. Period. So you're going to break your country, destroy your economy, destroy your youth. They're going to destroy everything that you have ever built up, and one day you're going to crawl on your knees to the Holy Emperor of Rome. And then you're going to remember when your founding fathers told the church to screw off, and from here on out, you're not, you're not allowed to come into this country. This country is going to be free. And then Rome does not forget. Rome did not forget that, what the, what the founding fathers of America did. And so when you tell the, you know, the, the boss of all bosses that from now on you stay over there in Europe and you do whatever you're going to do over there, but you don't come here. And the Catholic Church was not allowed to operate in the, new co in the colonies was not allowed to operate here. Catholics could not operate in America, period. Because if nothing else, the Freemasons who founded America realized, well, we don't want that screwball with all of his henchmen and murderers coming over here to run this country. And so what the Catholic Church did is they immediately sent people into the Jesuits, came to Mexico, and came in from the back door. Then they started coming up the back door, opening up missions. On, on California coast, knowing that the country was moving west, well, they, they got the missions all up and down California and Oregon, Cal the Catholic missions, and started working their way eastward into Nevada, uh, New Mexico, and, and, uh, and Wyoming with the Catholic missions. So a mission, anybody who's been in the military will tell you the word mission is a military term like Mission Impossible, it's a military term. So Catholic missions were a military order that was a, trying to overthrow the new republic. And so on the East Coast, it was a republic. The United States of America was a republic, and it was moving westward. Well, the Catholic Church came in through Mexico quickly and sent the military, they sent the Jesuits, who were a military order, into, uh, into California and all up and down the California coast, setting up military establishments like forts, like we did. We set, you know, set up forts and then move on, set up a fort and then move on. Well, that's what they did. They call them California missions. And so the missions were a political mission of the Jesuits to overthrow the United States of America. So if you can't stop them from the East Coast, at least you can work backwards. This is the first meeting the new Superior General of the Jesuits had with the press. Father Arturo Sosa demonstrated patience and a sense of humor, even when asked if he likes to be called the Black Pope. I think Mulemi is better suited for it. Regarding being called the Black Pope, I don't like it. The idea is to be uh, an organization, the Society of Jesus, that can help the Church when, where, and doing what the church needs. And who is going to determine what is, are the needing of the, of the church? The Pope. The Pope, because his function in the church is that. The new general, a 68-year-old Venezuelan, says that the Society of Jesus wants to serve the church within their own vocation, which is to serve the church and to support what the bishops and Pope ask them to do. What do I like the most about the Society of Jesus? I can give a very simple answer, everything. What attracted me from an early age was the Jesuits are an apostolic force in many areas. 
The new superior of the Society of Jesus was a university president for 10 years and a director of a social studies center for 20. He is a governmental man, served as provincial superior in Venezuela, and is responsible for the international institutions that the Jesuits have in Rome. In addition, he is also a deeply devout Jesuit priest. The Jesuits have this great wealth, a spirituality that puts you in contact with Jesus incarnated in concrete situations throughout the world. During the meeting, he said he is fine and feels calm about his new role. He thanked his predecessor, Spanish Adolfo Nicolas, who will now return to the Philippines to work where his superior has allocated him as spiritual director of a pastoral center. What was Rome? What was Rome? A republic? What kind of republic? A constitutional republic. They had a constitution. Did you know that? It was a republic. Did you know that? <laughs> what happened to Rome? It fell into oligarchy, and then into dictatorship, then into rampant immorality and socialism declined, fell, and became the Vatican. Anybody here doubt that? I can prove every word of it. The Roman Empire never fell. It changed its name. The emperor became the pope. This is the truth. The old pantheon of Roman gods became the pantheon of saints, and they are identical in name and everything else. Go into the Capitol building, stand right in the center of the rotunda, and look straight up at the dome where nobody ever looks. And what do you see? You see the apotheosis of George Washington, riding across the heavens in the chariot of Apollo, who is Apollo? George Washington. He's become God now. And around the perimeter of the Capitol Dome, you see all the old gods of the Roman pantheon. They're all there. Zeus, Mercury, Prometheus, all of them. You know what they think it should become? You know what they're trying to make it now? A world totalitarian socialist government headed by a, quote, benevolent, unquote, dictatorship. They're going to present you with a Messiah. The whole world will accept this person as a Messiah. You can call him the Antichrist, whatever you want. I don't care. It's going to be the answer to all your problems. Worldwide. And the whole world is going to bow down to this person. Whether you believe in Christianity, the book of Revelations, or not, I'm telling you this is what's going to happen, because I've talked to them face to face, and they don't even hide the fact. That person will wear the throne of the world. Behind that person will be a council of what they call wise men who will really be the rulers. This poor guy is just going to be the fool they stick out there to take the brunt of the public wrath whenever it's necessary. And you can knock him off if you want to. They just put somebody else up there. In Germany, the Vatican had in place Adolf Hitler. It is usually not emphasized, but Hitler was a Roman Catholic. Hitler praised the Roman Catholic Church, saying that, until now, there has never been anything more grandiose on the earth than the hierarchical organization of the Catholic Church. Heinrich Himmler, Hitler's head of the SS, was also a Roman Catholic. Frederick Hoffett wrote, Hitler, Goebbels, Himmler, and most members of the party's old guard were Catholics. After the war, Walter Schellenberg, former head of German counter-espionage, stated, the SS organization had been constituted by Himmler according to the principles of the Jesuit order. Himmler's title as supreme commander of the SS was to be the equivalent of the Jesuits general. Incredibly, although he killed and tortured millions, the Vatican never excommunicated Hitler. In fact, not one of the mass murderers of the Third Reich was ever excommunicated by the Vatican. The day Hitler died, the Spanish dictator Franco, also a Roman Catholic, had this statement run in the publication Reforma. Adolf Hitler, son of the Catholic Church 
died while defending Christianity. As a loyal son, Hitler killed heretics, including Protestants, Jews, Orthodox Christians, and even liberal Catholics. All told, the war dead numbered between 62 to 78 million people. John Kennedy was a Roman Catholic who turned against the Vatican and the Jesuits. Kennedy decided to be his own man, take his own counsel, and not take orders from Rome. He turned out to be a liberal Catholic, which is just as obnoxious to the Vatican as a Protestant or any heretic. Kennedy began to pull out of Vietnam. He ordered the Treasury Department to print money and not go through the privately held Federal Reserve. And he had plans for a new invasion of Cuba. See, Kennedy wanted Cuba back from Castro. The big lie is that Kennedy, he was, he canceled the orders. He didn't cancel the orders. McGeorge Bundy canceled the order for the air cover in the Bay of Pigs. That's according to Fletcher Prouty in his book, JFK. And on the, um, on the USS Essex, which was a aircraft carrier there, that the captain was told not to give any air cover to the invading uh, uh, patriots there in Cuba. But that cover was canceled, not by JFK, because the night before he said he gave a go-ahead. And to prove this point, there's a book that's been released about a year ago called Ultimate Sacrifice, written by Waldron. And in that book, it shows that JFK had planned to invade Cuba on December 1st, 1963, and get rid of that Jesuit, Fidel Castro. On November 22nd, he was killed, eight or nine days before the invasion was to take place. Like the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, John F. Kennedy's assassination was meticulously planned and executed, with Lee Harvey Oswald as the patsy. But you see, Gene Hill with Mary Mormon were right there at the limousine. And Gene Hill and Mary Mormon said that the driver turned around and shot, but they thought the driver was shooting back at the shooter. They didn't know the driver was shooting JFK in the head, along with the storm drain shooter. That was a simultaneous headshot. That shot from the grassy knoll was a distraction. They had a smoke. I mean, we've had smokeless gunpowder since the turn of the century. I mean, why would they use a rifle and have smoke? It was a distraction for the crowd to run up to the grassy knoll because the real shooters was the storm drain shooter and the driver shooting Kennedy in the head simultaneously. And I show in my book, Kennedy was shot five times. The assassination was done in a very public way to show other would-be presidents what would happen if orders were not followed. The assassination of John F. Kennedy is done in broad daylight as a warning to all the other leaders of the world. But it's also done with this viciousness because, you see, JFK was a Catholic. And they wanted to kill their Catholic boy who refused to uphold the temple power of the Pope. And so they killed him viciously and cruelly. It says a warning to any other Catholic who would dare trammel the temple power of the Pope. Former U.S. President John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson in 1816 about the rebirth of the Jesuits and the danger they posed to America. Adams stated plainly, I do not like the resurrection of the Jesuits. They have a general now in Russia, in correspondence with the Jesuits in the United States, who are more numerous than anybody knows. Shall we not have swarms of them here, in as many disguises as only a king of the gypsies can assume, dressed as painters, publishers, writers, and schoolmasters? I have lately read Pascal's letters over again, and four volumes of the history of the Jesuits. If ever any congregation of men could merit eternal perdition on earth and in hell, it is this company of Loyola. Jefferson replied back to Adams. Like you, I disapprove of the restoration of the Jesuits, for it means a step backward from light into darkness. Having no further need of Napoleon, the Jesuits made sure he was sent far away to the island St. Helena in the South Atlantic, 
While there, he was poisoned and died in 1821. In his memoirs, Napoleon maintained his loyalty to the Catholic Church, but had this to say about the Jesuits. The Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power, power in its most despotic exercise, absolute power, universal power, power to control the world by the volition of a single man. As the Jesuit agitation of the American states was reaching its climax in the 1850s, a trial occurred in 1855 at a courthouse in Illinois that would bring two fateful men together. These two men would join forces to fight the Jesuits. The first was a rebellious Roman Catholic priest by the name of Charles Chiniqui. The second was a lawyer by the name of Abraham Lincoln. Charles Chiniqui did not approve of the corrupt conduct of many of the priests he knew. These evil priests were drunkards, sexually promiscuous, and thieves, often stealing money and property collected from their parishioners. The heads of the Roman church wanted Chiniqui to ignore these illicit and illegal activities. When he did not, Bishop Reagan of Chicago and another priest by the name of LaBelle arranged to have Chiniqui accused of rape. Chiniqui needed a good attorney. An attorney by the name of Abraham Lincoln was suggested. The trial did not go well for Chiniqui. The general feeling was that he would be convicted. Fortunately for Chiniqui, a witness came forward for the defense. Her name was Philomene Schwartz. Miss Schwartz had been in Father LaBelle's house the day the plot to frame Chiniqui had been concocted. Schwartz contacted Lincoln and agreed to testify. She caught the midnight train to Urbana and met up with Abraham Lincoln and explained to him exactly what happened. Once Bishop Reagan and Father LaBelle found out about the potential witness, they fled the city. The prosecution dropped the charges and Chiniqui was vindicated. As they left the courtroom, Charles Chiniqui was in tears. Lincoln says to him, why are you crying, Mr. Chiniqui? He says, your agents have, your enemies have fled and you're free to go. And he said, I'm not crying for myself, Mr. Lincoln. I'm crying for you. He said, because I saw no less than 11 Jesuits with the sentence of death on their face today in this courtroom. And know for a surety, they will kill you for what you have done. Lincoln says, well, let this be my death warrant, and he gives Chiniqui a bill for a mere $50. And then Lincoln sobers up and said, It matters not where a man must die, but that he must die at the post of duty and honor. Chiniqui's words of warning to Lincoln would prove to be true. The conspiratorial hand of the Jesuits at work, a conspiracy to further their goal of a world under papal control. So, we're going to kind of fast forward in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7 where we see this little horn power come up uh, past this. First we see the, the lion come up, which is Babylon, and then the bear, which had the three ribs in its mouth because it destroyed three empires or consumed three empires. The Medo-Persian Empire bear raised up on one side. Greece with the four divisions, the four heads, and the four wings signifying the speed and then the terrible beast, which was Rome. Now, in, in chapter 8, these two are pointed out by name. In chapter 2, this one's pointed out by name. The word Rome never appears in these chapters in Daniel. Okay? How do we know that it's Rome is the terrible beast that comes after Greece? What's that? Ten horns, ten kingdoms? Okay, yeah. This power took captivity and control of God's covenant people. Okay? This is why this, is, this beast represents Babylon. Now, which was the next kingdom or empire that took over God's people? Persia. Right? And they allowed them to go back, didn't they? and rebuild the temple. 
Then what came? Greece. Greece was in control of Israel. Who was the next power to do that? Who took out Greece? And when Jesus was born, who was in control? Rome. It was Pontius Pilate, right? The provincial governor who had Jesus executed. Again, even after saying that he was an innocent man. So, who was in control of God's people? Rome. That's why it's Rome. That's why it's not the Incan Empire or some other empire. It's the, the countries, the kingdoms that gain control of God's chosen people. Remember, folks, in Daniel chapter 8, as we've looked at before, the little horn power applies to both pagan and papal Rome. It's showing the little horn power that comes out of the he goat. It applies to both pagan and papal Rome because they do similar things. Many of the characteristics that are attributed to pagan Rome are also attributed to papal Rome and vice versa. So this, for me, this, this helps me make sense of it when I see it like this. In Daniel chapter 7, you have pagan Rome represented by the fourth beast. Through the, prog the progression of Rome through time continues, and Rome turns from pagan Rome into papal Rome. And this is described by the little horn power of Daniel chapter 7. Now, different in Daniel chapter 8, it just talks about a little horn power. But it still describes what pagan Rome did, and then the progression of Rome through time to papal Rome. Many of the characteristics apply to both. So as a little horn power, if you could imagine, a little horn power starting, and as it's growing out, it becomes papal Rome. And that's what many people have asserted throughout the years, historians, that pagan Rome never really went away. It just changed its garments. And I think I think the Lord agrees with those particular historians, at least on that aspect, because he describes pagan and papal Rome as the same little horn power in Daniel chapter 8. Does that make sense? Now, it says not by his power. I want to ask you, who fulfills that one more? It says that he would, he would practice and prosper and destroy many, but not by his power. Not by his power. Did Caesar have armies and legions at his whim? Yeah. Did the papacy have armies and legions at his whim, or did he have to convince people to fight for him? He had to, he had to, he had to be an organizer, right? So he had to use the powers of, of the other temporal powers that were around him and use their armies. Interesting. Interesting point there. Luther said this from the, I hope I don't butcher this, Schmal called Articles, Article 4 of the Papacy. Therefore, just as little as we can worship the devil himself as Lord and God, can we endure this apostle, the Pope, or Antichrist in his rule as head or Lord? For to lie and to kill and to destroy body and soul eternally, that is wherein his papal government really consists, as I have very clearly shown in many books. So one of the issues with the papacy that's a little different is that they destroy people eternally. They destroy people with doctrine. They destroy people's souls, not only their bodies. In fact, if they're destroying your body, chances are you've saved your soul. Chances are you've saved your soul when it comes to Rome. So, the Roman Catholic version of salvation, you have to obey the Pope and not the Bible. That's a salvational issue, folks. That's a salvational issue. You have to follow the sacraments. You have to do the repetitive prayers. You can buy indulgences, pay into the church, become a monk or a nun. Confess, confession to the priest, visit the relics and get a special blessing from that. Praying to the saints, all of which are condemned in the Bible. 
submitting to the priesthood, that, as we've seen, that's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Practicing authority over the laity. Taking in the new version of the daily, the mass. You know, that's the number one thing in the, in the dark ages that people were killed for officially in the Inquisition on the books. There, I mean, there was many reasons why people were brought in by the inquisitors. But when they were actually condemned to death, what was written on the paper, the number one reason was people's refusal to worship the wafer, the Eucharist. To re the refusal to acknowledge that it was actually the body and blood of Christ that was going on in the Mass. That was the number one reason written on paper why people were condemned as heretics and burned at the stake. You have to believe their false doctrines. You have to do righteousness by works. And then after all of that, you probably have to go to purgatory and burn off some of your sins still. So, your eyes, in other words, your eyes are on the world and the things that you have to do down here. Your eyes are not where this man's eyes are, looking up to Christ as his Savior, looking to the work that he's doing in heaven right now. No, your eyes are down here on earth. If you follow that, those principles and those doctrines, you will lose your soul. That's how by peace he can destroy very many and has been for a very long time. Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar's Dream. We will interpret this chapter using the biblical historicist view on eschatology. Daniel 2 took place during the time when the Israelites were in captivity to the Babylonian Empire with Nebuchadnezzar as their king. One day, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a great image of a man which troubled him greatly. No man was able to interpret the dream but Daniel, who was given understanding by our Heavenly Father, Yah. Daniel 2, verse 27 and 28. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men show unto the king? But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Now here was the dream, Daniel 2, verse 32 through 34. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Daniel then proceeds to interpret this dream by starting with the head of gold, which represented Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Daniel 2, verse 38. Thou art this head of gold. Daniel then tells Nebuchadnezzar his kingdom will soon be taken over by another kingdom, the breast of silver, which is the Medes and Persians led by Cyrus. Daniel 5, 28. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then, after the rule of the Middle Persian Kingdom, we have the Thighs of Brass, which we know today as the Greek Empire, ruling all of the known inhabited world, led by Alexander the Great, Daniel 2.39, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. The fourth kingdom, the Legs of Iron, is what we know as the ancient Roman Empire, which ruled the known inhabited world for roughly 500 years. Rome eventually fell, and it brings us to the kingdom that we are living in today, the one right before the second coming of Yeshua. Ancient Rome fell, and was taken over by ten nations or kingdoms. This is the fifth kingdom as a whole, to rule as the feet mixed with iron and clay. Daniel 2.41 And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. We know these kingdoms of ten nations ruled by Rome in some way 
as Europe, and that is today known as Spain, Portugal, France, Britain, Austria, Italy, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Belgium, and the Netherlands. They never united as one kingdom, but ruled the entire known inhabited world as a whole kingdom under the headship of iron. That iron, of course, still being Rome in some way. This iron Roman headship would be what we know as the papal office of the Roman Catholic Church. This is huge to understand as a biblical historicist, to know how we should see today's papal rule from the Roman Catholic Church and the power they have over the world for the last 1500 years and counting. Now, can you see why the Catholic Jesuits created futurism and preterism as a way to divert and distract believers from identifying who this kingdom was and is? And now for the conclusion of the entire dream, Daniel 2.44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. This is the kingdom of Yah, led by Yeshua our Messiah, which will come to destroy all these kingdoms, including the feet made of iron and clay, also known as the Pope and his Roman Catholic Church. I'd like to start this afternoon by reading from a book that if you don't have this book, I would strongly suggest you get this book. It's called Vatican Assassins. Vatican Assassins. This book is about 700 pages long, and it takes a look at the rise of the Jesuit order, and it comes all the way down to Roughly the last major event it talks about uh, that I recall was the assassination of John F. Kennedy. You see, folk, and this, this plays out again. The Jesuit order before World War I was ever fought, they knew exactly what the war was designed for. If you get people involved in a war and there's enough bloodshed and enough broken hearts and enough crying mothers because they've lost their children. If somebody then comes along in the controlled press and introduces to you, let's have a League of Nations that's going to bring world peace. What's everybody going to do? They're going to say, that's the answer! That's the answer! And they're going to embrace it. Now, after this war that's going to be fought with America and Iraq and other powers, do you know what the Jesuit goal is? If there's enough bloodshed in the Middle East and there's enough people that die from all countries, then the controlled press is going to say, you know what? In order so we'll never have another war in the Middle East, we need to bring a peacemaker to that part of the world. And if we have a peacemaker set up in Jerusalem, the city of peace will never have another war. And so who will be brought forward as the great man of peace to rule the world from Jerusalem? The Pope. So there's a distinct and definite goal that they have outlined for the war that will begin sometime in the future. With a world government, the Jesuits could control the world, prepare for the Pope to rule the world as the man of peace from Jerusalem. The thing that's so incredible for us as Seventh-day Adventists today, when we realize from history the purpose of the League of Nations and the United Nations, that these were the Jesuits' plot to take over the world politically, and to make it possible to have the Pope rule the world. What do George Bush's masters want today? They want the Pope ruling the world from Jerusalem. And so, a bloodbath has got to be created in the Middle East that will be so bad, it will be so bad, that the world will cry out, 
And the press will say, we've got to have peace in the Middle East. Who can provide it? And then the Pope will be mentioned as the solution. In every case, folk, and it's a principle of Rome, it's a principle of the Jesuits, they create the problem and then they give you the solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have 10 uh, bloodline families that sit on a, uh, a, a council, and they are the ones who advise the Jesuits. And the Jesuits were created by uh, uh, um, Alessandro Farnese, who became Pope Paul III in mm -hmm. the Renaissance. Tom Cruise a secret member of the Colonna family. Colonna should be a name that comes up when you look up who really controls from behind the scenes should be Colonna, Borgia, Medici, Aldo Brandini. These are the real names. And this is uh, an ancient matrix of control. It goes back since the dawn of civilization. It, it received tremendous power in the Roman Empire. But something changed with the Roman Empire. As, as the Roman Empire stagnated and fell apart, the military Roman Empire gave way to a religious Roman Empire. Now, the executive order that will implement this, the executive order 11051, details responsibilities to the Office of Emergency Planning, or FEMA. It gives authorization to put all executive orders into effect in times of national emergency declared by the president, increased international tension, or economical or financial crises. Note that it covers domestic crises but does not even mention war or nuclear attack. Now, the only thing that has to happen for FEMA to be able to implement all the executive orders emergency executive orders, is for the president to declare a national emergency of any type, as long as it's a national emergency. Executive Order 10995 provides for the takeover of the communications media. Executive Order 10997 provides for the takeover of all electric, power, petroleum, gas, fuels, and minerals. Executive Order 10988 provides for the takeover of food resources and farms. Executive Order 10999 provides for the takeover of all modes of transportation, control of highways, seaports, and etc. Executive Order 11000 provides for mobilization of all civilians into work brigades under the government supervision. Executive Order 11001 provides for governmental takeover of all health, education, and welfare functions. Executive Order 11002 designates the Postmaster General to operate a national registration of all persons. Executive Order 11003 provides for the government to take over airports and aircraft. Executive Order 11004 provides for the Housing and Finance Authority to relocate communities, designate areas to be abandoned, and establish new locations for populations. Executive Order 11005 provides for the government to take over railroads, inland waterways, and public storage facilities. Now, all of these were combined under Nixon into one huge executive order which allows all of this to take place if the president declares a national emergency and it can be implemented by the head of FEMA, not by the president. The president has already given him that power under these executive orders. All of these were combined into Executive Order 11490, and that was signed by President Carter on July 20th, 1979, and is, in fact, law. 
Now remember what North said during the Iran-Contra hearing. He said that they were prepared to suspend the Constitution of the United States, and he said if it hadn't been for their getting caught that this would have happened. And all that did was delay it. This is what is still going to happen. President Bush issued a new executive order delegating to the director of FEMA powers which were vested in the president by the Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act of 1988. And although the order was described by the White House as simply a technical matter, in reality the revision delegated to the FEMA director direct responsibility for a large number of items which were earlier only the president's prerogative and that includes responsibility for general federal assistance, federal emergency assistance, hazard mitigation, individual and family grant programs, and the power to direct other federal agencies to assist in an emergency. And that's the key. All other federal agencies will come under FEMA. Of course, the president retains the power to actually declare an emergency. But as soon as he does that, the implementation of the measures utilized will be transferred directly to the director of FEMA. All right, your question, where did God come from, assumes that you're thinking of the wrong, uh, obviously it displays that you're thinking of the wrong God, <laughs> because the God of the Bible d is not affected by time, space, or matter. If he's, if he's affected by time, space, or matter, he's not God. Time, space, and matter is what we call a continuum. All of them have to come into existence at the same instant, because if there were matter but no space, where would you put it? If there were matter and space but no time, when would you put it? You cannot have time, space, or matter independently. They have to come into existence simultaneously. The Bible answers that in ten words. In the beginning, there's time. God created the heaven, there's space, and the earth, there's matter. So you have time, space, matter created, a trinity of trinities there. Just, you know, time is past, present, future. Space has length, width, height. Matter has solid, liquid, gas. You have a trinity of trinities created instantaneously, and the God who created them has to be outside of them. If he's limited by time, he's not God. The guy who created this computer is not in the computer. He's not running around in there changing the numbers on the screen, okay? The God who created this universe is outside of the universe. He's above it, beyond it, in it, through it. He's, he's unaffected by it. So for and the, I, the concept that a, a spiritual uh, force cannot have any effect on a material body, well then I guess you'd have to explain to me things like emotions and love and hatred and envy and jealousy and, and rationality. I mean, if your brain is just a random collection of chemicals that form by chance over billions of years, how on earth can you trust your own reasoning processes and the thoughts that you, you think? Okay, so... Um, I, your, your, your question, where did God come from, is assuming a limited God, and that's your problem. The God that I worship is not limited by time, space, or matter. If I could fit the infinite God in my three-pound brain, he would not be worth worshiping, that's for certain. So that's the God that I worship. Thank you.